Hey guys, um, alright, so as advertised, um, I want to catch up on the lectures so that the last three we can focus on the treatment of mental disorders. Um, so I want to jump back to where I left off at the end of last class, which was um, talking about psychopaths and um, move through the personality disorders and just finish uh, off that lecture uh, so that we can go on to the treatments. All right. Um, let's start here. Um, again, sometimes I think it's, it's poignant to be able to take um, some of what you're learning and, and um, think of it in a context that's sort of real. And I mentioned Paul Bernardo and I realized after class that, that a lot of students had not heard of Paul Bernardo um, and, and uh, Tammy Hamalka. Um, well, and Carla Hamalka, I should say, and Tammy, uh, her sister, um, and, and didn't know of the whole case, despite the fact that it literally happened here. Uh, and so it's, it's such an extreme case. Uh, I, I really should say that most psychopaths are not nearly as um, horrid as, as Paul Bernardo is. In fact, I'm going to come back to that issue in a second. Um, but I did want to um, suggest that, you know, if you want a picture of the ultimate scary psychopath, it probably is Paul Bernardo, and there's aspects of his case that really will reinforce a lot of the things we talked about. Um, so this is just the Wikipedia page for him, um, but notice some of these things. So in, in 75, Bernardo's father, Kenneth Bernardo, fondled a girl and was charged with child molestation. Um, so to the extent people, you know, start to think of genetic or environmental influences either, it looked like his father was a, was a bit of a creep. Um, he also sexually abused his own daughter. Um, the wife of Bernardo's father was kind of uh, messed up by all this, so she was depressed, lived in the basement. Um, and, you know, another, another thing to kind of um, mention as they go, so uh, look at this, this phrase here, um, starting here. Though the elder children, the el elder children in the household, felt the effects of the emotional and mental turmoil with his father that was charged with stuff and the mother that had moved away, young Paul appeared to be unscathed by it. Um, in a book about this called Lethal Marriage, the author says of Bernardo that he was always happy, a young boy who smiled a lot, and he was so cute with his dimpled good looks and sweet smile that many of the mothers just wanted to pinch him in the cheek whenever they saw him. He was the perfect child they all wanted. Polite, well-mannered, doing well in school, and so sweet in his Boy Scout uniform. A psychopathic person knows how to project that image, knows how to be what people want them to be. Um, and I mean, the other interesting thing about this is he's raised in the situation of a bunch of you know emotional people going through difficult times, and yet he is unscathed. Somehow, these powerful emotions that all those were feeling around him did not affect him. He did not resonate with those emotions. He was able to just be who he was despite those emotions, which is part of that lack of empathy. Okay, so um, just to give you guys a sense, so he went to Sir Wilfrid Laurier Collegiate. Some of you probably did. And of course, he attended the University of Toronto Scarborough. I suspect in the in the late '80s, um, his picture is up in the uh, that hall on the way to Tim Hortons um, somewhere. Um, these this gives you a sense of between '87 and 1990. So he was born in in '64. Uh, yep, August '64. Um, so by this point, he is a 23-year-old man, and he was starting to rape people um, in Scarborough, here, often in the, in the valley. Um, 21 years old, 19 years old, 15 years old, 15 years old, 17 years old. So he's mostly going after relatively young women. Um, nearly caught in 88. Um, know etc but his rapes continued so despite the fact that he was nearly caught like like look at kind of look at this nearly caught by a, a metro toronto investigator on may 25th 1988 nearly caught after committing all these rapes what's he do five days later he rapes another woman in mississauga this time so he moved a little bit away but you know he's already raping another woman five days after nearly getting caught you know that's the sort of bravado or, or whatever I guess and so you know he's 
clearly a serial rapist and he and he was known as the Scarborough rapist um, but you know that's sort of when things get a little weirder as as you go a little bit further and especially weird when you get to Tammy Hamulkin and the thing I want to highlight here is the issue that I will that I have already suggested of how psychopaths sometimes find another um, so if we sneak up here a little bit sorry sorry to bounce you around but in 1987 notice this is while he's raping everybody he, he certainly didn't stop raping after he met Carla but he met Carla they became sexually interested in each other almost immediately unlike the other women he knew she encouraged his sadistic sexual behavior so it may literally have been the case that Carla knew about these rapes and was cheering him on to an extent uh, so he had found somebody he could confide in somebody he could probably brag to um, you know look at what I'm getting away with and, and I hope you kind of see that dynamic now where where yes he was probably well he was the instigator of most of these events but Carla was by his side sometimes figuratively as I assume was the case through these that never suggests that Carla was actually at the site of any of these but when we get to her sister so Bernardo in 1990 was spending a lot of time with the Malka family who liked him uh, he was engaged to, to Carla but flirted constantly with the youngest daughter um, kind of weird, right? In fact, he became obsessed with Tammy Hamolka, pe peeping into her window and entering her room to masturbate while she was sleeping. Check out this now. Carla helped him by breaking the windows in her sister's room to allow Bernardo access. Um, again, kind of, kind of weird, but Carla's sort of helping things on. I mean, it really gets sort of weird. Um, here, Carla worked in a veterinary clin clinic. She stole this anesthetic, halothane, um, and on December 23rd, two days before Christmas, as a Christmas present. So Paul was upset that Carla had not been a virgin when, when he met her, and she felt bad about that, I guess, that she hadn't allowed him to take her virginity. And so they had decided that taking Tammy's virginity instead, her 15-year-old daughter, um, would be a way of compensating. You know, just the thinking is, is just pretty screwed up. So they administered sleeping pills to her, um, and basically, you know, o over time, they ended up eventually raping her, taking her virginity. Um, if, you, if you look here, with Tammy's parents sleeping upstairs, the pair videotaped themselves as they raped her in the basement. Um, Tammy began to vomit. They tried to revive her. They called 911. They um, changed the evidence, but eventually she was pronounced dead. So a lot of people say this was a critical moment for, for them, Paul and Carla, because until this moment, to the best of anyone's knowledge, they hadn't killed anybody. And in this case, they accidentally killed Tammy. So their you know, primary motivation was sexual. Um, but they killed Tammy. Um, and basically, they then moved out. So they moved out of the house, rented a, a house somewhere else to let her parents grieve. Probably because neither of them really felt that sad about it anyway. Because psychopaths don't feel sad. Um, and then they went on um, to abduct Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French and the details are there too and it just gets more and more horrific so you know this interplay does show a little bit of the genetic potential link the environmental kind of situation that they were in um, it shows that relationship between two psychopaths and how they can often find each other and when they do find each other sometimes the criminal behavior can reach a whole other level um, potentially because the primary criminal person has a fan now, for lack of a better term, um, or potentially just because the two together feed sadistic uh, beliefs, you know, well beyond what he, anyone would do on their own. Um, all right, so kind of dramatic. Um, I also thought, you know, if you want to see this guy, one of the things that puzzled everybody was 
he's, he's a relatively good looking guy um, you know depending on the picture some of them look kind of weird um, and as a couple they were a relatively good looking couple I don't know what some of these pictures are um, but as a couple they were you know considered in fact sometimes they call them the Ken and Barbie killers because they looked like Ken and Barbie they looked like good looking young couple etc um, but you know deep down monsters so let's go back to here. Stop that. I don't know what I just did. Okay. So, so this is where we were. And, and, and the point I was making here is that these psychopaths have this weird situation of being very good at understanding how people see things and how they react to it so they have the theory of mind they can see the world through other people's eyes and this allows them to manipulate those other people in very powerful ways but despite the fact they can see the world through other people's eyes they don't feel what they feel they don't resonate to those feelings and, and let me just highlight that a little bit that empathy that feeling what somebody else feels naturally you see someone that's sad and you kind of feel that sadness see someone that's scared you feel their fear that is considered empathy is considered uh, a very strong pro-social component to psychology I've straight I, I've stressed over and over again in this course how social humans are how much we require social interaction how much it is part of how we live we live in large social groups so something like empathy um, literally is the glue that's why we call it pro-social. It connects people. It prevents people from doing things that cause harm to others because they would feel that harm. They would share that harm and they would feel guilt and they would feel whatever. A psychopath does not share others' pain, therefore does not feel guilt for any pain they have caused. And that w that's what makes them potentially scary. Um, now, I say potentially, but I want to, I want to back off here. Well, I want, I want to highlight what I mean by potentially. There is a claim out there that many psychopaths um, are part of society and are functioning perfectly well and have found a niche that does not involve criminal behavior. So obviously, Paul Bernardo, you know, had those psychopathic tendencies, but he also had some really twisted sexual um, fantasies and ideas, uh, and so the goal. The way he used the weird mindset he had was to obtain that, to rape, to, to, to do horrific sexual acts. Um, but the claim is that other people use it differently uh, and that sometimes it, it kind of works. So um, an example we mentioned after class when I was talking to people is, I don't know if anyone's watched the new Sherlock Holmes. You can kind of think of any investigator, but the, but the Sherlock Holmes with the cumber lock, cumber bun, cumber, whatever the guy is. Um, I remember one scene from watching one of those where he comes to a scene where there's been some horrific murder and he's happy and excited. He's looking at all the clues. He's trying to figure out things. This is his world, that Sherlock Holmes, who is, by the way, depicted as a very odd, well, he always is, as a very odd character, but a very intelligent character, one that can see how things fit together um, and who can, over time, sometimes be a little manipulative in making you know things come together to see if his theories of whatever are right or not and as depicted in that show he does not feel a lot of emotion for the victims in fact if you think of a good police investigator we want someone that's sort of emotionally detached if a if an investigator comes to a crime scene and instantly resonates with all the pain and suffering that crime caused well that police officer is going to be really messed up um, they're going to be the kind that you imagine and that we see depicted in bars, dealing with what they saw in the day and maybe depressed and maybe thinking humanities, whatever. But the psychopath, who's an investigator, doesn't feel that and in fact is just worried about the facts and what happens. What happened? And they understand the manipulative mind of the criminal. They might share that manipulative mind so they can kind of think of what the criminal was thinking, what were they up to, what were they doing, uh, and therefore could be a very effective police officer that does not take their job home with them, that literally can leave all this horrific stuff and 
and, and leave it unscathed, as the word was used for Paul Bernardo. Some people claim criminal lawyers who defend the scum of the earth can do it because they love the game of law, all the thinking and all the whatever, and they don't worry, you know, let's say you were defending Paul early on and you thought he was the Scarborough rapist, but you're giving him a defense and you know that if you're successful, he will go free, and if he goes free, he will probably rape more young girls. But that doesn't bother you. You want to win. It's all about winning. And you're not connected to all that emotionality. And so the claim is, we all vary in empathy. Some people are really extremely low on empathy. Sometimes that can cause them to do criminal behaviors or expose themselves in certain ways, but some might actually use that weird state of mind and find niches in life where they can be highly successful um, without turning to criminal kinds of acts like a homongo or a Bernardo. All right. So let's talk about this a little bit and, and start to now tear apart antisocial personality disorder from um, true psychopathy um, a little bit. So starting over here on the left. Um, and let's, and let's go to the bottom. Let's go talk to factor two. So, so what they're kind of saying here is if you look at people that generally fit into the description I've been giving you, you realize that there's sort of two factors related to specific um, aspects of their behavior. And some people only show the second. And some show both. So let's go to the second. These are people we think of as more antisocial, antisocial personality disorder. They don't tend to be as dangerous, but they're showing some of the tendencies that are also shown by the more dangerous people. So what are these tendencies? Impulsiveness. They do something because they just want to. Okay, off they go. Irresponsibility. They don't care too much about what they're doing and you know how it may affect others to some extent. Proneness to boredom. They have to be doing something. Um, people with antisocial personality disorder can't just sit on the couch and do nothing. They have to be up to something. They have to be thinking about something. They have to be whatever. Um, they don't have realistic long-term goals. Usually they think they're going to become rich and powerful somehow. Um, they don't have a programmatic path they're following usually. Um, usually they just have this goal of a get-rich-quick scheme and they're always on to something. Parasitic lifestyle. Um, you know, because they're not very organized and structured themselves, they tend to charm others and live off them if they can. Poor behavioral controls, they do whatever they feel like. Early behavioral problems, so we will see in, in children that they don't follow rules very well, they don't work well in the school system, etc. Juvenile delinquency, um, revocation of conditional releases when they are um, there and by the way these extra items that you tend to see with both sex life impersonal and poorly integrated so they don't have a deep sort of sexual romantic relationships very often uh, many short-term uh, marital relationships so, so they might get married but the marriages don't last um, relationships in general don't last criminal versatility what a weird term um, they may engage in criminal acts and a wide range of them um, generally speaking Okay, but so people with this stuff, we tend to think of as antisocial. Um, there is the notion that they're doing criminal behaviors here, but the criminal behaviors might be less extreme um, in ways I'll highlight in, in a moment. So these are people that are troublemakers, for lack of a better word, that don't follow the rules of society, so antisocial, they're, they're the opposite of that glue to some extent, um, and they don't care much about others too much, and, and they do whatever they want, and that kind of thing, okay? Um, rebels, etc. Um, but in addition to all this, what really makes somebody a psychopath uh, is if they have this first factor, which we talk about as primary psychopathy, which is this glibness and the superficial charm. So everybody who met Paul Bernardo liked Bar Paul Bernardo. It just seems like he's above everything. You know, that, that's what a psychopath can seem. Like, like they kind of feel like that, like they're in control, like they're strong, like they're not worried about stuff, like everything's going to be fine, everything's good. 
positive, smiling. Hey, come on, guys, life, let's grab it. Um, and so that's very attractive to other people, right? Every, everyone else is hung up with all their issues. This person's not hung up. They just want to go out and do stuff. Grandiosity, the stuff they want to do is big stuff. You know, let's go do something important. Let's whatever. And so they think on this grand scale. Pathological lying. It's like they can't not lie. Um, always lying, always whatever. This is linked to the short-term relationships because it tends to be caught out eventually um, and people get sick of being lied to. Conning and manipulative, so always trying to manipulate people. Lack of remorse or guilt when they get caught in something, they don't feel bad about it, um, etc. Uh, shallow affect, you know, other than this energy and this let's go get it and this sort of positive thing, they don't laugh when things are funny, they don't cry when things are bad. It tends to be pretty, pretty flat, pretty shallow, um, no extreme emotional reactions. Callousness and lack of empathy, I've been talking about that a lot. Um, and so, you know, somebody with antisocial personality may feel a little bad when they do something and it causes trouble for somebody else. People with primary psychopathy don't feel bad at all. Uh, and they don't accept responsibility for anything bad that's happened. Okay, so it's when you have these characteristics that you go from being called somebody with antisocial personality disorder to psychopath. Um, these are the ones that really make somebody dangerous. Um, when you don't feel guilt, when you don't feel empathy, um, then it's dangerous. All right. What do I got going over here? Um, well, I just want to tell you about a little bit of interesting research trying to understand psychopathy a little bit. And th this is just one kind of neat study they did um, that some people think is really important. Uh, they did a study where the, the psychopath had to learn some relationship. So they're being presented with stimuli and they have to learn how to categorize things. Uh, but we're going to teach them in one or two ways. So, um, yeah. One way is we're going to give them electric shocks when they make incorrect decisions. So early on, imagine they're like sorting something. Um, so you give them cards with a certain number, one, two, three, or four of symbols on them that could be squares, circles, triangles that are either red, green, or blue. And so they're seeing these cards and they have to figure out how to sort them. Am I sorting them like all the red ones here and the blue ones here or all the squares go here, the triangles? They don't know what they're supposed to do. But they're supposed to learn by how they're punished. And so one of the punishments we give them is electronic shock. When they put something in the wrong thing, they get shocked. The other punishment we give them is we start them out with a little pile of cash, but we remove money every time they're wrong. For psychopaths, they learn, well, they don't learn well at all from shock. Punishment doesn't seem to bother them. It's somehow like they're immune to the normal physiological effects most of us would have when something bad happens to us, like shock, you know, a real physiological stimulus. They can't seem to learn very well from that. But if you start taking money away, then they learn. Okay, so money is like this, this intermediary for power or strength or the ability to make plans, bring plans into action. They seem to value money. Um, and, and they will learn to do things to not lose money. But, they, but pain seems not to have relevance to them, um, which is just kind of fascinating. Just say that. All right. Environmental causes and cognitive causes. Um, is the environment important to, the up, to, to, to somebody developing these behaviors? Or are they just born this way? Um, to quote that famous philosopher, Lady Gaga. Um, I don't think we really know very well. Uh, I think a lot of people tend to think on the born this way side, but we do know that environment matters, and there's a hope that it could matter more. So what I say about that is I told you about that 21st century toys thing. Um, their claim is that if children, because they want to get these into schools, use play this game a lot, they will develop empathy. So the, the whole premise behind that toy is that empathy can be learned. 
it should be learned and we should be teaching it in our schools along with everything else is that true I wonder sometimes but I kind of think it could be true maybe it's true so if empathy can be learned that suggests you know the environment has some role I, I say we all are on some scale of how uh, how much empathy we have well did our upbringing contribute to that did the experiences we've seen from our parents from our family members the way they were rewarded and punished perhaps for for being empathetic or not did did we some of us learn that it's good to be empathetic and did others learn that it's not remember Paul Bernardo had a pretty messed up upbringing and so maybe empathy was not rewarded he was he was surrounded by negative emotionality all the time uh, and so maybe any time he was even a little bit empathetic, he was essentially punished for that with negative emotion, sharing a negative emotion. So maybe he learned not to share emotions. We don't know. Very, very kind of controversial. Um, do they also learn, as kind of depicted in this picture, some sort of anger towards authority figures or rules or boundaries in general? Um, there's still a lot of work on this. and. There's no clear. There's no clear answers. Are there cognitive causes? Well, again, there is this lack of empathy, and that seems to be, you know, the critical component of the more severe severe psychopaths, is that they literally are capable of things most of us aren't because of the way they think and perceive the world. Um, so, does that mean, like a depressed person, you could teach them to think differently? Well, first of all, do they even want to think differently? Um, most of them don't. Most of them are quite happy with how they feel and how they interact with the world. So it's hard to teach somebody to think differently if they're happy with how they are. Um, but it's a fascinating issue. One thing I, I will mention before I leave this slide, though, is also related to this whole idea of environmental causes or how, how could we rehabilitate for lack of a better word somebody like a Bernardo um, I will mention again a movie I think I've mentioned before uh, but it's called a clockwork orange um, I probably mentioned it when we talked about operant conditioning or classical conditioning before because it's actually a movie about a psychopath the main character is clearly a psychopath who's capable of absolutely horrific deeds so the movie starts with him being callously horrific um, to kind of underscore that psychopathic nature to him but then he gets into jail and they offer him a quick way out of jail if he will participate in a psychology experiment which is a psychology experiment about classical conditioning so that movie is essentially about trying to rehab a psychopath using psychological principles um, it's 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 a troubling movie at times um, I, I always feel the need to say that it's got some ultra violence in it um, in a way, the thing that will make you hate the violence, though, will, will make you think about psychopathy uh, a little differently and how it can be rehabbed. So, so let me just throw that out there. All right. Enough psychopaths. Oops. I had somebody come to me after class and say, uh, say uh, they're now scared to go in the valley uh, because of everything I talked about. You know, don't be scared to go in the valley, but be smart. You know, bring, bring, bring support. <laughs> don't go down there if you're a woman. Be careful going into the valley alone. Um, Bernardo is, is locked up, but, you know, be smart. But just whatever. Th these people are out there, but they're very uncommon. Um, they're, they're highly depicted in movies and stuff, and so we think they're everywhere, but they're not. Um, all right, so let's move on. There are a bunch of other personality disorders. In fact, I think this is a list. Let's kind of go here. Um, Hey, that's not where I expected to go. Um, so let me just say personality disorders list. So here's 10. There's more than 10. Uh, but this, this will talk you through a bunch of different personality disorders. Um, and, and yeah, I'm going to focus on this one in a second. But... Um, check those out there's lots narcissistic personality disorder somebody who just loves themselves all the time well, that's not so bad is it um, etc so you can go through here and you can you can find out more about the various personality disorders that exist but 
I'm going to focus on this just to give you a feel because the antisocial personality disorder is a pretty extreme one. You know, a law-breaking person who does whatever they want, etc. Um, but there's other ones that are very complex, and, and borderline is one of these highly complex ones. And I, and I want to mention it because I want to sort of tie it in when we get to some of the therapy ones. Um, and I also just want you to be aware of, of this disorder because if you run into it, it can be difficult. Let me explain. People who have what we call borderline personality disorder are focused on abandonment. They've typically either been or certainly at least feel like they've been abandoned on many occasions. So literally their parents may have abandoned them. So, you know, in some cases this is literal abandonment. In some cases it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy as, as I'll talk about uh, in a moment. But they constantly are changing themselves in weird ways. So the character I'm kind of highlighting here was from uh, the girl with the dragon tattoo. Um, the character in that movie, if you watch it, I think has borderline personality disorder. And she has a rel relatively extreme look. So this is, I think, the, I don't know if this is an American version or not, but a relatively extreme look, but may change her look very regularly. Often people with borderline personality disorders do that. They're trying to stay interesting in some way. They have these intense but short-lived relationships. This is the thing I want to highlight um, to you. Somebody with borderline personality disorder, when they meet you, and if you're nice to them, they think you are the answer to their prayers. You are the person they've been looking for. And in a very short period of time, they attach very quickly and very intensely. So suddenly you are their world. You are everything. You are the only person that matters to them. And I think at first, this can feel kind of nice, it can feel kind of good. Wow, this person thinks I'm amazing. But it doesn't take long to start feeling like it's a problem. Especially a problem because of their focus on abandonment. When you start feeling like this is too much, too fast, and you start to push back a little bit, like, hey, it's Friday, let's, let's go out and do something tonight, I want to do blah, 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 and you're like, you know, I, I, I actually have to study tonight or something like that. You will see a glint in their eye that's kind of will say, oh my goodness, you too. You are going to abandon me too. And suddenly you feel the trap. You know, you're in this situation where this person wants to be with you forever. After knowing you for two days, they want to be with you forever. And when you pull back, they sense you're going to abandon them and they start to get really scared, really worried, and you suddenly have this person in your life that you don't know what to do with. If you're nice to them, they're going to cling. If you push them away, they're going to crumble. Um, and it can be a very difficult situation, which is why I kind of like to you know, warn you about this a little bit so that you at least recognize what's going on. Because sometimes the only hope uh, or the best hope is to get this person help um, of some sort. We're going to come back to that theme in a second. Um, so they have these because of these short-lived relationships, because they're constantly feeling abandoned, they're often constantly reinventing themselves um, after one of these abandonments. So their self-image changes totally. What they value, what their goals are, you know, what they're trying to do in life can change overnight. Um, they become and reinvent constantly. They're very impulsive. They tend to spend money responsibly, they binge on things, um, and they have often a lot of substance abuse issues. Um, and they can become suicidal or have self-mutilating behavior. So they can literally harm themselves sometimes to the point of killing themselves. So that, you know, that reaction they have to abandonment, that fear, that whatever, and, and the person who's seeing this, their fear like, oh my god, that person's going to do something, they might do something. Uh, and that's what makes it so tricky. So let me use this, by the way, since we're here, as a situation of saying, what do you do? Um, I had a student in my class come to see me uh, one day because when I talked about this, she said, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm in this trap. So this particular woman was um, a lesbian. So she had met this other girl and this girl had done exactly this, just attached to her. Um, and now the student that I was talking to didn't know what to do. And we were trying to puzzle this through together. Um, you know, one obvious thing is to try to get that person to some sort of mental health clinic. Um, it's tricky how to do that. Are you doing that because you care about the person, which is going to encourage that latching on kind of thing? It, every, everything's difficult when you're dealing with a borderline personality person, but they have real, they need help. Um, and so that's, that's the tricky dichotomy you have. Um, but the other thing is for any of these situations, I encourage any of you, if you're in contact with somebody who you feel needs help, and especially if you feel trapped um, in some way by the relationship you have with this person, realize that there are resources for those who have the mental illnesses, but there are also resources for those people caught um, in the situation. So, you know, the one we all probably know about is Al-Anon, which is uh, a group that basically provides therapy, for lack of a better word, certainly support to people who are family members of alcoholics. So they're not about helping the alcoholic. They're about helping the people who are living with and trying to help the alcoholic. Similarly, there are support groups like that for just about every condition. Living with schizophrenia, living with a psychopath, that would, that would suck. But certainly borderline, we were able to find some groups and they had advice that's better than I, as the professor of this course, could ever give you. These are people living through what you're living through. And they are often in a fantastic resource. They have online chat things. There's often phone numbers. Sometimes there's local meetings, etc. So, you know, if you find yourself in a situation like that girl that was in my office that I was telling you about, then um, that's, one, that, that's one good place to go looking for help. Uh, and they can maybe even answer the question for you, how do I get help for this person? Okay, so I just want you aware of that as we go through. Again, I highlighted borderline personality disorder. There are a lot of other personality disorders. We just don't have the time um, to do them all in this course, I'm afraid. I'm already over time here. <laughs> all right, so let's move on. Um, the final one we're going to talk about here is substance abuse disorders or substance related disorders. Um, when I've talked about this in, in, in past years, I couldn't help but connect this to Rob Ford. Um, Rob Ford clearly had substance related issues. Um, but the fascinating thing about Rob Ford is he was mayor of one of the biggest cities in North America. And depending on who you ask, he w was or was not a complete train wreck of a mayor. You know, some people say, well, he's a, tr he's a train wreck of a person, but he actually did okay as a mayor. Uh, a lot of people would disagree with that, but, I mean, he was running the city to some extent. So this shows the dichotomy that's sometimes true of a lot of people who's, who have substance abuse issues. They sometimes are very successful, but their success can sometimes make their life really weird. And for certain people, the way they react to that stress um, is to go looking for some sort of substance to help them cope. Um, there's a famous song by the Rolling Stones in the 60s called Mother's Little Helper about housewives discovering volume and how it helped them deal with the mundane chore of being housewives. Uh, that was the Rolling Stones way to say, hey, get off us about the pot. You know, our mothers are just as bad with the volume. Uh, but it's an interesting thing that that was... You know, that shows the spectrum, I think, of this. So first of all, how, what percentage of people are, are hit? Huge, okay? Um, there's some people that don't want to call this a mental illness in the same way that schizophrenia, for example, would be considered a mental illness. But, I mean, we certainly recognize it as a, a mental illness, and as such, it dwarfs most of the other ones. Uh, I began the class with Amy Winehouse singing... Uh, her, her song about rehab, I don't want to go to rehab, um, I won't go, no, no, no. Uh, she was surrounded by people saying, you are killing yourself, um, with alcohol primarily in her case. 
and she basically channeled all that into a song that said, I know you all think I'm killing myself, but I ain't going to rehab. Too bad. And she killed herself um, with alcohol. You know, that's how powerful it can be. If you read um, Anthony Kiedis' book, Scar Tissue, so he's the lead singer of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, he talks about his addiction issues and how he completely kicks them on multiple occasions, goes through all this work, all this effort to get off whatever, gets back into being successful, everything's fine, and then the book drove me crazy because he will say things like, and then one night I was at home, just sitting there, and suddenly I got this urge to go into the dark part of the city and get some more morphine or whatever. And for the next two years, he's, he's completely addicted again. You know, just this little decision he makes at a bad time after going through all this work to get off the drug, and he's back on just like that. All right. So we have two categories that we talk about, substance use disorders and substance induced disorders. Um, substance use disorders is really when somebody is addicted to some substance to the point where it's taking over their life. Uh, often they are having marital problems, they're having financial problems, they're having social problems of all sorts. If you're somebody like an Anthony Kiedis, you might not be showing up, or an Amy Winehouse, you might be showing up to concerts so drunk that you can't even sing anymore. Uh, etc. It's obvious at some point that the alcohol, you, you don't have the alcohol, the alcohol has you or the morphine or whatever it is. Um, so we call that addiction um, and of course you know that primarily we need some form of intervention there. Often you need family or friends to get involved because the person is so caught up in their addiction that they're, they're very seldom going to help themselves which is tricky. Uh, we also talk about substance induced disorders. Um, these aren't as extreme, but it's still related to the issue that your use of some substance is causing problems in your life. You may not be completely addicted to it, um, but it's still affecting your life in some negative way. Okay, where do we go with this? Yeah, we know, I, I don't know what this refers to, so ignore this. <laughs> Uh, but we know there are genetic and physiological causes. So, um, especially in alcohol, that notion of a genetic predisposition seems to be very much true. That if somebody, and, and typically it's males, typically it's Western males, um, you know, sort of European descent, uh, that's describing myself to some extent. Um, but if somebody like myself, especially, you know, my family, if the males in my family have a history of alcoholism, then I can be pretty darn sure that I have a predisposition towards that. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, what that means is I seem to be the kind of person that when I'm under stress, alcohol somehow makes me feel good. It has some sort of rewarding properties for me. That's the way people think about it. That you know, alcohol affects different people differently. Some people really enjoy the feeling, some people don't enjoy the feeling, um, some people use it for different reasons, um, but to an alcoholic, it becomes a way of dealing with stress. It becomes like a social support network in a bottle. Um, and so for people that are genetically predisposed predisposed, that's the idea that when they're in a highly stressful situation, A, they're probably likely to turn to alcohol, probably because it's rewarded them in the past, they've been rewarded in the past for doing that, and B, when they do, they will enjoy the feeling. It will make some of the stresses go away. It will work for them. And if you're that kind of person, you have a high risk of just turning to it constantly. Um, in many other cases, by the way, you might ask, why do famous people become addicted to drugs of various sort? And one of the stories there, um, I, I'm kind of getting ahead of it a little bit, but I'm going to say it anyway. One of the stories there is that when we get these people, when they, when they become famous, they're suddenly expected to perform when we want them to perform and perform really well. So there's times we want them to be up. But they're on Letterman, they better be interesting and exciting. Um, they have a live show, I want everything left on the stage. Um, if they're an actor, you know, when you're in the, in the movie and doing your part, you better be doing it well. Um, 
And sometimes, you know, imagine somebody like the Red Hot Chili Peppers touring around. This is mixed with travel, sometimes distant travel. It is mixed with media interviews where you have to be on. And so suddenly this external agency, literally, is controlling your life. It's telling you when you have time to go to sleep, when you have to be up and exciting and performing, when you have to you know, be having some meeting with somebody uh, in the media, etc. And the claim is that this requires, this is not a natural way of doing things. The natural way is when the sun comes up, then you start to wake up and slowly, etc. When it goes down, you get tired. But if you're traveling all over the world, jet lagged, um, expected to be up here, expected to be whatever, drugs can be a way to turn yourself on when you need to be on and turn yourself off when you need to be off. So the claim is for a lot of entertainers and performers, the reason we see so much substance abuse is because they are trying to artificially affect their physiological state. Um, and they start using drugs to do that. They take amphetamines when they need to be up, cocaine, you know, so many, so many um, performers would use cocaine because cocaine made them feel strong, powerful, alive. If you're gonna be the lead singer of the Red Hot Chili Peppers with Flea going crazy behind you, you'd better be strong, powerful, and alive or you're gonna just be boring. And the worst thing for a performer to be is boring. Okay, so that shows an interaction between the sort of physiological side of things and the environment that a person finds themselves in. And especially if you have that genetic predisposition, now you're really going to turn to substances to kind of help you modulate your internal state. Are there cognitive causes? There surely are. Um, a lot of the therapies, if you, if you look at Alcoholics Anonymous, for example, they will focus on trying to teach people how to think about their lives differently. One of the controversial aspects of Alcoholic Anonymous is one of the first things they ask you to do is believe there is a power greater than yourself that cares about you. So, you know, whether you interpret that as a religious entity or whatever it is, they think that once you believe that, once you believe that there is a force that's more powerful than you and that cares about you, then you can look to the source for strength and guidance. <clears throat> that's a cognitive change. They also, by the way, very strongly try to um, give you a real social support network. So the idea of this buddy system where you know, you're feeling stress, you want to drink, and what they try to tell you to do is, well, what they tell you to do is before you reach for a bottle, reach for the phone, you have somebody else who's been where you, ha where you are, you can call them, talk to them, tell them, I want a drink right now, and I'm about to have a drink. And the hope is that they can substitute for what that drink can provide. You're under stress right now, you need a way of dealing with the stress, perhaps a social interaction with a person who understands can do for you what the bottle does, and can replace what the bottle does. Um, and so if you start to believe that uh, and accept that as a true alternative, then that's important for the path to success. So a lot of the, the treatment is focused on the cognitive causes and the way people think about drugs and what they do or don't do for them and whether they're helping them or, or not. You know, one of the first things you have to do with someone with a substance abuse disorder is make them realize that this drug is not their friend, it's their enemy. Uh, and so they have to think about the drug very differently. They like the drug. All right, cool. So I think that largely gets us through that stuff. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, but uh, yeah, we're now through the personality disorders. In fact, that's the kind of tour of the disorders we're going to take. There are more disorders. Um, there's only so much class time in intro psych. And so there's a whole course on abnormal psychology. You could, you could take that course and learn about a lot of these things in a lot of detail uh, if, if you find it interesting. But we're going to leave it there and we're going to shift gears for the last three classes and say, okay, now you know about some of these disorders. How do we go about helping these people? What are the current treatments? How do they work? How well do they work? Um, and what works for what? That's where we're going. All right. Shut up. Have a good one. I will see you guys Friday. Remember, there's a class Friday. All right. Bye-bye.